Hey everyone, welcome to Psychology with my wife. I'm the psychology student. And I'm the wife. <laughs> Are you now? <laughs> um, so this is going to be our first special guest episode. Um, Gianna is writing her qualifying exams for her PhD. So she is out of commission for the time being. In the meantime, Rory Wheat here is visiting from Alberta, so he agreed to do an episode with me. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself, your schooling, career, all that <laughs> stuff? Sure. My name's Rory Wheat. I grew up in just outside Vermilion, Alberta, on a small ranch. Um, that's where I met Julian. Uh, I think it was you... You 14 soccer, maybe? Yeah, definitely soccer. Yeah, that we first met and we were once rivals and then Julian transitioned to the Vermilion school and then we were teammates in several different sports. And that's when you started winning games. <laughs> <laughs> Those Clan Donald boys were tough, but <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, recently finished school at the University of Saskatchewan where I did uh, an undergrad degree in environmental biology and a master's in uh, sustainable energy. And I now am working for an organization called Student Energy, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later maybe, and several different startup ventures that I'm um, obsessively working with <laughs> guys working constantly <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a grind lately but having a ton of fun with it and happy to be here happy to be the on the podcast first guest yeah spot well I'll see how it works because yeah. i don't know it's a first for me too so <laughs> i'll play a wife for a day <laughs> <laughs> you can be my wife <laughs> yeah so i guess Tonight, we're going to the Jays game. Yep. Pretty excited about that. Yep. Blue Jays and Boston, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to a game before? <sighs> Years ago, uh, Winnipeg. Oh, Winnipeg when they had a team. When yeah. they had the team. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It was pretty young, but it was a ton of fun. Can't wait to go and enjoy a beer and a hot dog and a good game. Yeah. yeah. Was today the hot dog day? I can't remember. I'm not even sure. Yeah. One Hopefully. of the days there's like $2 hot dogs. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. So you've, uh, leaving Friday, um, we checked out the Kensington market yesterday, which. Yeah. Getting a good look at the Toronto lifestyle. It's a little different than small town Alberta or even Saskatoon. Yeah. If you're, if you're not from Toronto, Kensington market is like the, the hippie hippie area hipster village yeah yeah <laughs> a lot of unique individuals over there <laughs> yeah it was, it was a good good place to people watch we'll put it that way <laughs> do some studying yeah um yeah we also we're gonna go to the st lawrence market check that out uh we did go to the comedy bar last night yes that Had was kind of fun at the yeah. comedy bar uh five dollars for 11 comedians that we got to see yeah and then free open mic after yeah. So it was good. It was really yeah. good. I'm definitely, I'll say it on here too. Now I'm held accountable. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely going to go to an open mic one night just to say I did it. I don't even care. I'm assuming I'll bomb hard. <laughs> I hope I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll wait. At least then you guys can fake laugh or pity laugh for me. Yeah. Or yeah. just laugh at Or just that. laugh at you. <laughs> Uh, uh, I yeah. think that'd be good to do. Take a lot of guts. Um, so this is the start of your like traveling journey for the next couple months. Or yeah, what? yeah, both for work um, and just for pleasure. Being done the degree that I was doing over the last two years, decided to book a couple of adventures. So Toronto being the first step in that. Uh, here for a week and then. Making my way to Peru in a couple of weeks. Going to spend a couple of weeks there, um, meeting up with some friends. We're all working remote. It's going to be, it's going to be cool. Um, living out of Airbnbs and working remote from the beach, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, doing the whole Machu Picchu, 
Machu Picchu Inca Trail, um, which would be a ton of fun. And then that's the the, like the tall mountain there. Is that yeah, it's the it's like a Mayan ruin. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna be sick. I'm jealous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it'll be really good. I think it's uh, it's pretty cool. You got to go and like stay a couple days in the area beforehand and acclimatize and and, uh, and then it's a four day hike up the mountain to see the ruins. Yeah, it'll be good. Hmm. Yeah, I've never been. Uh, out in North America, so. Yeah, this will be your first time in Latin America, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Right, you went to Ireland and stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah. A few years ago, I did an Ireland trip. That was the best, best trip I've ever been on. And can't wait to go back to Europe as well. That's definitely on the list. Maybe to fit it in this year, but definitely starting to fill up the itinerary for the year and also uh, run out of budget room pretty quickly. Well, if you're if you're constantly working, your uh, the time zone might kill you. You're gonna be up all night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. I'm assuming it's like nighttime when it's daytime here. Uh, Peru is, I think it's close to that. Maybe 16. I shouldn't say, and I can't remember exactly. Well, maybe Peru, 16 actually, hours. But I mean, uh, Europe. Oh, Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's quite, quite different. Well, I actually have to take a break. Hours. Yeah, unless you want to do night shift. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, depending on what venture I'm doing, sometimes could work. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So let's get into it. All right. All right. So today's episode. We are going to be going over climate change and anxiety disorders and kind of got this since uh, Roy's a background in environmental sciences and all that. So uh, not to put you on the spot or anything, but um, you a while back, you kind of told me about climate change, like what it actually is. Yeah. Can yeah. you give another description of it? Um, essentially, since the uh beginning of humans using fossil fuels, we released enough greenhouse gases to alter our atmospheric composition that in turn has led to a gradual warming of our, of our earth. One of the leading causes is our use of fossil fuels for energy in, in different forms, whether it's for getting around in your vehicle or turning the lights on in your home or keeping the heat on. See, um, I remember something about, you're saying like a cyclical cycle thing about carbon and. Right. Sure. Yeah. Cause that's, it's, that's the problem <clears throat> is that it's going to get to that point where it starts going crazy again. Yeah. Like for the last, and I'm, I shouldn't say too many specific uh, numbers because I don't have any references offhand to back them up. But for the last several millennia, we have been, uh, Earth has been experiencing a relative state of equilibrium as far as temperature with, with very, um, low fluctuations in temperature over the, over the years. Um, and really this has been closely correlated with the development of human society. It, it allowed us to um, diverge away from nomadic lifestyles and start to get into agriculture and uh, kind of more cohesive societies. And as we start to push the boundaries on the climate uh, today, we are um, threatening that equilibrium and potentially... Uh, can can disrupt it to the point where it will go back to large fluctuations, which is what we, was experienced by Earth before right. before this equilibriums, and uh, those can be devastating to ecosystems all over the world in different ways. Not just in warming, which is a common misconception, but warming in some areas, cooling in others, um, along with a lot of other hmm. impacts. Yeah. What if there's another uh, like virus trapped in an, I, 
and the ice and then we go through another covid another pandemic yeah oh <laughs> i just hope we don't <laughs> be brutal a, might be a valid concern i'm not sure yeah that would yeah so um mentioned that this is gonna be climate change and anxiety so there's that crossroads of climate change anxiety um so for those of you who have no concept of what it is, it's, uh, it's climate change anxiety or also referred to as eco anxiety. It's like a chronic fear of environmental doom. <laughs> Boy, that's, uh, that's, yeah, a so, gloomy, that's a gl- gloomy start to the podcast, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but right. It also like could apply to there's a forest fire, or tsunami, whatever that could be your climate change anxiety or eco anxiety is due to those disasters happening. And then you have anxiety afterwards because um, your home is destroyed and all that. Right. So, yeah. Or even beforehand um, uh, ecosystems that are at the verge of being harvested or being destroyed for, for anthropogenic reasons or for natural causes, I think. I guess, um, in Canada, especially, there's obviously a lot of uh, issues around preserving forests, preserving lands um, that are important. And I think there's a lot of anxiety around how you do that legally and ethically. And right, yeah, there's a whole, yeah, whole bucket of, of things related to eco anxiety. I think that's definitely the thing I miss moving to Toronto is all the trees. Yeah. Stuff. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah. They, yeah, it's tough in a big city like this. They they try to put green spaces in here and there, little parks, but it's it's not the same as no. Well, you're... like I could literally hop on a dirt bike and just go, yeah, ride for like I don't know, probably ten kilometers. Oh, easily. Yeah, I think the first time be... I rode a dirt bike was at your place, actually. Yeah, almost. First time I crashed a dirt bike was also at your place. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the mud. In the yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good times. Uh, yeah, a lot of good times there. <laughs> um, so I actually, I didn't find too many articles. They're all pretty much the same on climate change anxiety. Um, one was in, in how it relates to, yeah, anxiety and, and just like psychology. Just like studying it. Yeah. Like I've never actually looked into it, the, the psychology behind it or papers published, but um, I'd be interested to hear what you found. A lot of them are like, starting to get the research because um a lot of them were like oh this hasn't been studied and it should be studied kind of thing so we did this small study um the one article is called climate change uh or climate anxiety in children and young people and their beliefs about government responses to climate change um that's that's super interesting yeah um so maybe a little bit more background on my work uh Outside of the the ventures that I've been working on, um, I also work for this organization called Student Energy, which is a global nonprofit that basically um, raises awareness uh, around uh, energy systems, education, and awareness around energy systems all the way through training, coaching, and mentorship, and uh, even into uh, career development through a series of programs that they have. Um, they offer this to young people, youth focused, uh, around the world. And the, over the last year, 2021, they did a global survey f- of youth, um, where they asked them a series of questions around climate, energy, uh, energy transition related questions. And one of the top answers was that young people around the world believe that governments should be more involved in helping solve climate issues. Well, it makes sense because you obviously, I think this is one thing that you need to restrict companies in a sense there. Yeah. And that's where, yeah, I don't want to dive away from psychology and into (laughs) economics because I, I'm certainly no expert in economics either, but that's where I, I find there's a balance where you do need some government regulation or policy incentives that will allow for then innovation and free market economies to do 
what they do best and and develop new technologies and and projects um things like carbon a price on carbon is one of the best ways to do that um it's been proven all over the world already in in countries primarily in the eu where you have a you implement a price on carbon and the national greenhouse gas production uh, emissions falls yeah. considerably in relation to that. Is that like a carbon tax and then you would get like a uh, tax refund if you um, have good practices kind of thing? Is that how it works? Um, sort of, yeah. Like a carbon tax is kind of one way of, of putting it in place. Um, then there are uh, certain markets, um, compliant markets where, uh, greenhouse gas emitting companies, especially large emitters, uh, for instance, in Alberta, um, they have a, a policy that's, that does this, where if you are a large industry emitter, um, producing, I think it's over a hundred thousand tons of, of greenhouse gas emissions a year, or when I say greenhouse gas, that's, um, people often get mistaken between greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. Um, right. Greenhouse gas is just kind of an umbrella term for there's several, several different emissions, emission related gases, carbon dioxide being one of them, um, nitrous oxides, um, yeah, sulfur oxides, they all, they all contribute. Uh, methane, a big contributor. But what it, what it breaks down to is carbon dioxide equivalents they call it and so they just use carbon dioxide as kind of a a standard um to gauge a gauge yeah yeah Yeah. basically um anyway so implementing a carbon tax kind of puts a price on that carbon for those large industrial emitters and they then have to either pay the tax by um in in the case of alberta purchasing carbon credits oh right yeah or reduce the amount of emissions that they're producing right. through okay. implementing, you know, energy efficiency infrastructure into their facilities or um, using clean energy to power power their operations, uh, purchasing clean energy or developing clean energy themselves behind behind their fence to for their own facility, or just purchasing offsets outright, which can be from any number of different projects. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, this uh, this study too talked, I didn't actually look at the survey questions um, entirely, but uh, they surveyed 10,000 youth um, in a bunch of different countries, like states, France, uh, okay. a few EU countries kind of thing. Um, <laughs> the thing I didn't like it about it though is they said that 45% of the youth, that's 16 to 25 years old, said their feelings about climate change negatively affect their daily life and functioning. Wow. Yeah, that's that's crazy. It, like, it really I, is. Cause... To, I, I get that there is um, like stress and some anxiety kind of, but I don't know if I believe that, that you, every day, 45% of the, the youth said that their daily functioning is affected by the climate yeah like that i think that's uh that's two things that's both it's it's too bad that that you are feeling that and that's um probably in part due to inaction from government not enough strong right. action right. on climate change and that that's sad that you feel that way and, and probably have less, less support of the the system overall because of that. Um, but it's also on the other hand, like, yeah, like you're kind of getting at it's, it's too bad that something that is really, I mean, collectively in our control, but individually out of our control in, in a lot of ways that you're letting that impact your, your day to day happiness isn't right i don't think right yeah. is that yeah would yeah you agree yeah with that? yeah I, I definitely agree and that was the part that um i didn't like and that i don't like when stuff like that's in like journal articles because mm. then someone else reads that and they're like oh 
well, they did this study and it shows that. But it's, yeah, everyone's yeah. everyone's depressed because of climate change, <laughs> which like it's a huge global issue. It's it's totally something to to be worried about. But I just think on like an individual level, that's there's something systemically wrong there as well that that people are are linking depression or, or stress, anxiety to something like that that's kind of out of your individual control. Um, I guess there are there are lots of things you can do as an individual to reduce your carbon footprint or just be more environmentally conscious. Um, but I wouldn't let the 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 big picture of climate change right. and the impending doom that it potentially can bring to so many areas of life. I wouldn't let that, you know impact your day-to-day decisions or, or happiness level. Right. Do you think with like, it's not just climate change, but just the fact that these um, youth, a lot of youth will just watch the news or something. And obviously some like news can blow stuff out of proportion. Not that it's fake, but like cause undue stress and fear over things. Do you think that's part of it? Totally. Yeah. Um, not to say that I don't like. I think climate change should be a, a bigger issue on the news than it is some days about certain things. But just the news in general, absolutely, is just like, the I, way they I've, go about it. I've definitely. Um, it's difficult even on social media. Like I, I try to do use social media less and less. But news, especially, I, I don't follow any any news yeah, no. news cast programs or or social media channels at all. Um, and even then, it's it always finds its way onto your social media feed, some in one way or another, and you have to be very selective in how and what you're what you're digesting, I think, and what you're reading and and reading yeah. into, because that's how you get the anxiety about it. It's like your day to day life is impacted over and over and over mm-hmm. by images, thoughts. Yeah, um, I could see that way if you're watching the news every day mm-hmm. about climate change yeah, and stuff you the, would have daily um anxiety about it i yeah, can see that yeah i think there's probably a, a really good link there that sh- that should be the next study is <laughs> is uh, how many of those youth are on social media how many of them are you know engaging with or or even just digesting news yeah, related yeah. content every day hmm. um yeah, yeah I, I did uh that I don't I t- didn't tell you too much about that alcohol presentation I did, but I seen something on there that it was um, um, when I was researching. Apparently, youth see an average of three ads a day. So if you think about what kind Thought of it'd be higher, yeah, it. I think maybe in, um, due to like social media and stuff, you probably see more. But oh, on I'm average, sure. all youth, right? right? Sure. Um, C three ads, so whatever those ads are, and in that case, they're talking about like alcohol ads and how you see them everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, um, same thing with. Or were those ads specific to alcohol, like three um, alcohol ads per day? Um, you know what? I actually now that I think of it, I, I can't remember. I'm not gonna say it was either or. So, <laughs> feels like that would be a more realistic. Yeah, three stat. alcohol ads. Yeah, I feel like I probably see well. In Canada, at least, or North yeah, America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure see in Ireland, it's alcohol. probably like 20. <laughs> it might be more in <laughs> Ireland, yeah. They do, they do like to drink in Ireland. They they like to party and have a good time. Um, You, you made a good comment when we were talking just before here about uh, youth having anxiety about, like, not being able to do anything. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, Want to expand on that again? <laughs> yeah, um... This is where my work with student energy and student energy as an organization, I think is, is a really incredible, incredible group, um, doing some really awesome things because they're directly trying to engage youth in the conversation around climate change and energy, um, give youth a voice in the conversation and, uh, empower them to, um, become change agents in their their own communities because I think that's a large part of it is that young people are 
left out of the conversation um, more often than not, whether it's talking about climate change, energy, um, politics, any, you know, large industry. It's, it's, yeah, it's not very often that you see, you know, youth delegates that are there giving the opinion of what young people are experiencing. And, and that can be really frustrating, I think, uh, for a lot of people, especially considering the, the, the unequal balance in, in resource ownership, um, which I think we see like in the, the housing market in Canada today where young people can't afford to buy a house because the price has gone up so much. And that's because older people own all the, yeah. all the assets and capital. Um, and I, there's, I know that the, there are numbers to back that up. I don't know off the top of my head, but what percentage are of, of our capital and assets in Canada are owned by, by boomers versus millennials versus Gen X, but it's, it's significant. Oh, I would say, yeah, it's gotta be like at least 60 to 40, maybe 70. Uh, I think 30. it was about 60 in, in the hands of the boomers, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Listeners, you'll have to go Google that. Leave but, a comment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, frustrating not being in that conversation, not being able to have a voice especially when, and this is the nature of climate change itself, is that, you know, we're not going to feel the real effects immediately of climate change. We're not going to experience the, the disasters or the, the drought or, or the flooding or the melting of the ice caps in the next two years. You know, it's going to yeah. be 10, 15, 20 years down the line when we're really feeling that. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, we are going to be adults having our own families and and the people, the boomers that are currently owning all the assets, you know, they don't have to worry quite so much about the impacts right. on yeah. even the impact that it has on the economy in the future is going to be substantial no matter what. So it's a stressful thing that young people are, are thinking about more and more and organizations like student energy are able to give them a, bit of an empowered voice, um, a seat at the table, I guess, if you will, mm -hmm. for um, engaging in those conversations. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's great. That's some of the like stuff I'm doing with mental health. Totally, too. yeah, very, it's very how to well change, Yeah, the youth. How to change the mental health um, field by using the youth uh, yeah. voice and lived experience, stuff like that. So. Yeah, young people are... They're, uh, an untapped resource for a lot of industries, man. They're tenacious and ambitious and yeah <laughs> and you know we got that we've got that youthful energy that should be brought to the table in my mind and should be you know kind of harnessed and used in effective ways to to push for positive agendas and um rather than you know just letting the grown-ups handle it all the time figure things yeah, out yeah well it's like you don't need to be 40 or 50 to come up with new ideas totally yeah like, Although you have more life experience and yeah. like, I guess ways, understanding ways, how the politics work in like your organizations, all that stuff. That's like half of it. Yeah. Or maybe even more. It's probably most of it is how to like argue your point and like get it pushed through and mm -hmm. what connections you have. So. Yeah. And that's the biggest argument that, you know, the next generations will say is that, well, we have experience. We've, we've done these things yeah. before. We've done all this stuff before, but how do you get experience? You gotta yeah. do, you gotta yeah. do things. You gotta have the opportunity <laughs> to go and kind of, you know, experience failures, yeah. experience successes, grow your, your resume. Yeah. And young people don't have those opportunities unless you give them to them. And yes, yeah. yeah, it's, well, it's, it's a little fallacious too, because, um, just because you've done it before, it doesn't mean you're doing it right. Or, yeah. like yeah, effective that's right. or anything like that so <laughs> yeah no i think we've <laughs> yeah there's a lot of examples of that yeah. where you know uh status quo isn't always yeah well, the best like way to do up things in the age we're at right now you would think you looked when you're like 16 you're like oh they know what's up 
Yeah, yeah. And then you get to this age and you're yeah. like, I still don't know anything. I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Just making it up as I go. That's but, right. So I honestly, before I was a little, not skeptical, but I didn't really understand um, what climate anxiety would actually entail. But like, I think you made some very fine points that there is reason for some climate anxiety and it's not maybe the way I perceived it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think like, in a big picture look at it, yeah, there is reason. There are systemic reasons to, yeah, yeah. to worry about. Um, but on a day-to-day, -day, I think that just because I think people should be happy and not experience anxiety every day that there, there needs to be, you know, need to yeah, have solutions yeah. for individuals to kind of come to terms with how to live on a day-to-day -day without stressing about yeah. about that. And that's where I didn't agree with it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, I did. I like yeah. that conversation we had there. Um, so, yeah, so I guess that's a good segue into anxiety in itself, not climate anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so when people anxiety. usually... Anxiety. <laughs> this is a good topic. It is. I like talking about anxiety. Well, <laughs> not really, but... <laughs> yeah. It's love-hate. Yeah, it's a love-hate love -hate relationship. Yeah. Um, I think when people usually talk about anxiety, they're talking about uh, general anxiety disorder, and it's part of a group of anxiety disorders. Um, they all have similar conditions, but they're they're all different. It's like timelines, stuff like that. What the anxiety is caused by. In general, the anxiety is like um, it's often confused with fear which is like an emotional response or to a real or like imminent threat. But that's what it mm -hmm. feels like, I guess. Um, right. And also, similarly, uh, stress can also be confused with anxiety because it also has um, some, most of the same symptoms. Um, but again, these symptoms are like due to things that are happening in your life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was going to ask, what's... The difference between generalized anxiety disorder and general anxiety or stress. Anxiety is um, the anticipation of a future threat. Um, whereas like a fear or stress is clearly due to something. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the way I kind of understood it is that say you're stressed about something happening, a relationship or something. Um, that's stress. But then if you don't have that relationship anymore or um, it's not occurring anymore, it's not a real threat, um, but then you're, think you're anxious about it happening again or like the consequences of it, that's anxiety. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Yeah, no, I think that does. And it's very relatable. <laughs> yeah. um, so does everybody... You know, and, and to some degree, have a generalized anxiety disorder. Do you um, think everybody, because ex everybody experiences stress, that's part of yes. being human. Yeah. Um, so I would the say line there that like whether you have a disorder that's just general anxiety, or maybe you just don't know how to manage. Like, yeah, it's just like stress. you're having anxiety kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, just managing stress. Um, so generalized anxiety disorder, it has to it. You get diagnosed according to the basically the DSM five, like a psychiatrist or something, and you have to have um, more often than not for at least six months um, a bunch of these systems or symptoms. Symptom. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't control your worry, um, and you need three of these symptoms. So it's restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge, easily fatigued. Difficulty concentrating or your mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbances. So the difference um, to actually have a generalized anxiety disorder, these need to be there for at least six months. Okay. And then you, otherwise it's just anxiety kind of gotcha. thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, I think generally it's either it's genetics or whatever. Um, if it's more than six months, it's probably a lot longer and, than six months. Right, yeah. yeah. A persistent issue. Yeah, yeah. Should be addressed. 
The second one in the anxiety disorders is a panic disorder. Right. Um, so it's characterized by panic attacks, which are sudden feelings of terror that strike re- repeatedly and without warning or potentially due to a trigger. Um, and a panic attack is often con- uh, confused with a heart attack. Yep. Because um, it's got the chest pain, heart palpitations, dizziness, yep. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I've had one. Yeah. I've had a couple. One major, though, that I thought I was dying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was How long terrifying. did it last? Ah, the m- main symptoms of feeling like you're you're suffocating and having a heart attack at the same time was probably like 20, 20 what, 25 minutes maybe. Oh, geez. Yeah, it was quite a while. Yeah. Uh, I was during a basketball game back in high school. So I was also taking my inhaler thinking I was having an mm. asthma attack. Right. Huh. Took that a few too many times thinking that that was going to save me and that um, the I think it's palmacord is the, the medication but basically dilates your airways so yeah. then you're breathing a ton and you're getting more ox- way more oxygen than you're used to and you're, you can get a little lightheaded from that too so it, it actually made the symptoms worse uh, yeah <laughs> and then yeah Jeez. really thought I was dying yeah I don't think I don't know maybe when I was doing drugs back in the day it uh I had a panic attack, definitely. Yeah. Um, but I've never had like a, a true like chest pain, almost dying yeah. panic attack. But yeah, you're not missing out on much. Yeah. I'm I'm glad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um another one is phobias. Um so oh, okay. strong irrational fears of a certain place, event, or objects. And a lot of time it leads to social isolation to avoid those fears. Mm. Um and for example, social anxiety disorder is it's a social phobia, and in the same sense, climate anxiety is a climate phobia. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, like the word irrational in that, because our fears seem so rational at the time, hyper rational even, mm-hmm. and even to an extent, things like social anxiety, you know, are sort of programmed into our brains from like. The stone age is when we, yeah. you know, you needed com- to build community and have good rapport with the people around you or else you were ostracized or could be isolated yeah. and you, then you die because you get eaten by bears and wolves. Whereas now that's not so much of an issue mm-hmm. and we're still sort of programmed. And now it's, it, so what was once rational is now irrational. Yeah. It's uh, it is a very phobia. subjective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually in the uh, DSM. That's one of the things um, when you're diagnosing someone is that it can't be due to a cultural or societal uh, accounted to that. Okay. So Interesting. you need to consider, yeah, the culture where you're, they're come from. They yeah. Come from. Yeah. So. So something considered a disorder in one area. Yeah. One yeah. culture or geography might mm-hmm. not in another. Yeah. So Global News actually sent out a survey to ask Canadians what their biggest fears were. What do you, so there's uh there's a list for men and a list for women. What do you think was at the top of those lists? Public speaking. <laughs> That's yeah, definitely. It's not no? the top one, oh. but it's, it's on the list for, uh, for men. It's number three. Not even on the list for women. Uh, it's, uh, it's a sixth one. So it's oh, not wow. five. That's a big difference. Yeah. Interesting. Number one, uh, death maybe would be my next guess. No, no, no. There's another one. It's like once you hear it, you'll be like, oh yeah, I should. Spiders. <laughs> uh, spiders is. Is it up there? Yeah, number two for women. Oh wow! Yeah, spiders. Wow. Are, I, what's it called? Agoraphobia or something? I can't remember. Arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. Yeah, it's arachn. I don't know what. Snakes. Really? Yeah. Snakes are higher than death and snakes are higher than death and public speaking. Yeah. That's surprising Um, to me. (laughs) uh, Number two for men was heights. Huh? Yeah. Um, Number three for women though is natural disasters. Interesting. I wonder if climate change falls into that. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe. (laughs) So it causes (laughs) natural (laughs) disasters. Um, Chatelaine is another like magazine website whatever oh yeah they did a poll as well 
And they found that terrorists were people's biggest fear. Really? Mm -hmm. Huh. Which I don't, I actually, I should have checked the year that they did this poll, but yeah. maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah. If it was done in like 2012, it might <laughs> yeah. be pretty relevant to <laughs> terrorism. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you, what do you think your, uh, biggest fear would be do oh, you think it's on that list public or? speaking for sure yeah 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 i uh it's really my only major phobia that i'm aware of yeah i don't like cuddling with snakes but <laughs> but i'm certainly not yeah. like to see a snake you know yeah, no. in the grass like growing up on a farm you'd see him slither by every once in a while and yeah. say, oh, that's a snake well, i made the mistake of picking up snakes a couple times they freaking stink oh <laughs> yeah Garter snakes, yeah, they have this like scent to okay. ward off. So when animals bite them or whatever, mm -hmm. it like leaves a bad taste yeah, in their mouth. Yeah. So yeah, they just it stinks. Did you ever get bit? No, no, I didn't. no. I didn't bite the snake either. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a good thing because it stank, eh? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, social social anxiety ver like and and public speaking would be the I guess as far as fears public speaking. Yeah. And like, have done lots of it and still do it to this day, but just, just get very, very nervous. Yeah. Like, it can be months leading up to it. I'll have waves really? of anxiety yeah. around a public speaking event and just have to be really, really well prepared, well practiced for me to feel comfortable going into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm like, I suck at public speaking and that's definitely like a fear of mine is yeah. like actually properly doing it and not like a lot of times my mouth will just stop working yeah and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this uh podcast has actually been helping oh uh, yeah quite a bit yeah yeah, you bet. yeah i was even a little nervous just starting the podcast you know you get the butterflies <laughs> you're not sure what you're gonna say it's weird there's no one watching no but yeah. you know people are gonna watch later so that's the thing <laughs> thousands of them <laughs> yeah um i was just thinking of that too made me think of do you remember in saint paul when we were walking through McDonald's and this muskrat yeah. came up. <laughs> That's a core memory for me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'll ever forget. Out of any of the trips. <laughs> the muskrat attacking yeah. Julian. Yeah. I was in the like, middle of a, it just a, a comes McDonald's. galloping at me in the McDonald's drive through We were like, walking through a McDonald's drive through yeah. for, first of all. Don't remember why we were doing that. Yeah. I don't. At like one in the morning or something. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't even drinking. No, I think it was a. I think it was a sports trip. I think it was yeah, it was a volleyball trip. trip. Volleyball trip. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, but yeah, this <laughs> muskrat. So it's basically, if you don't know what a muskrat is, it's a basically a massive rat. <laughs> yeah, a large water dwelling rat. <laughs> yeah, and this thing was like running at me, and it was like snarling, kind of making whatever noise a muskrat makes. It was in full attack mode, and I just like I just had regular shoes on, and I booted it as hard as I could. Like I was like. I better kick it, otherwise it's gonna bite me. And it like hit the fence <laughs> and then started squirming and then stopped moving. I was like, holy man, I almost <laughs> died or got rabies or something. <laughs> yeah, we'll say it had rabies so that yes. so it doesn't sound like animal abuse. I agree. <laughs> but I would say muskrats are on the top of my list now. Oh, for fears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was wondering where that story was going. <laughs> yeah, no, so that that adds up. I, there's a, again, it's like for phobias and stuff, it's irrational fears because mm -hmm. like if there was like a Wolverine, like sitting in the, right beside you, holy man, would that be scary? Yeah. Like that's, you a, would have some anxiety. A rational that. fear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very rational. Yeah. Um, Just like the fear of heights is irrational. The fear of falling is rational. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not scared of heights. I'm scared of falling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I when I look over your eleven floor balcony here, it, you know, look down, it doesn't bother me at all. I can look down, and watch people, but if I was to uh, fall, yeah. <laughs> that'd yeah. be a different story. For three seconds, you'd be scared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or like when you're harnessed in, falling from, uh, being afraid to fall, like oh. bungee, bungee cord, or like know? even like. Um, tightrope walk and we, oh yeah whatever, or yeah. just like doing construction or something yeah you, uh, in canada in uh irrational fear 
in Mexico ir- or a rational fear because they don't do uh, as many safety standards there. So you, honestly, you could die. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but anyway, uh, agoraphobia is actually the next anxiety disorder. Which and one's it's, that? Oh, I think I've heard of this one. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, two or more of the following um, symptoms. Uh, using public transport, being in open spaces, being in enclosed spaces, uh, fear of standing in line or being in a crowd, and being outside of the home alone. Right. Have yeah. you have you seen Shameless? Yes, I was gonna okay. say. Yeah, I forget her uh, name, but Sheila. She's, Sheila. Yeah, she won't leave her house. That yeah. was agoraphobia, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's a big one. Oh. So the next uh, little part here, we have the podcast. Um, you know all the the different types of anxiety disorders. Um, how can you alleviate some of the symptoms? Um, I think no matter what, it requires requires a little bit of introspection. Um, if you have severe anxiety, uh, the first thing you should do is look at like lifestyle changes because there's some obvious things like we're talking about um, stress and stuff from um, relationships, social media. work, social News. media, stuff like that. Like, look at some stuff. Like, look at what gets you riled up. Maybe don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the obvious ones. You should know this. Like, limit your alcohol, caffeine, other drugs, because those are always... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could probably sort your uh, tool bag, if you will, into, like, two two categories. One that removes unhealthy habits Mm -hmm. and the other that implements healthy habits right yeah so removal is probably your it might might even be your more difficult one because those habits are already ingrained yeah hard to break a it's hard to break (laughs) a habit yeah well especially when they're like comforting Mm -hmm. things that you're doing right yeah you're not you're not going to those habits when you're in a good headspace when you're happy when you're (laughs) You go to those when you feel shitty and you feel like, Mm -hmm. you know, you need to have a shot of dopamine or, or, or feel something, um, uh, yeah, feel something in your, to make you feel good. Yeah. Well, it's even like, well, obviously like every drug, there's like cocaine, alcohol, all that. But even with like nicotine, it's just like by the fact that you're reaching for the cigarette instead of actually dealing with your anxiety it just makes it worse. Mm-hmm. And it like hides it kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. And then uh, part of the lifestyle changes, like really look at what triggers your anxiety. Like you might have to like, I think, um, journal stuff almost. If you have a lot of anxiety, you, I think you would have to journal. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's lots of, lots of different tools that you can add to the, add to your life part of the tool bag your your implemented tools i guess and i think one is totally journaling to if you got anxiety and you're you're constantly battling overthinking i think that journaling is a really good out for for that or uh not an out but uh a way to get it out yeah um, yeah that's a good way to put it and not internalize it not not think things over and over and over on a loop yeah. Break the loop by letting it just spill out onto a page, and like I've I've been journaling for like several months now, and it's been super effective. Don't even necessarily have to go back and read what you wrote; it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's yeah. just a matter of getting it out of your head mm-hmm. temporarily, and same thoughts might be back there tomorrow. But just keep doing that over and over, and yeah, eventually your brain kind of learns. Oh, we don't need to keep. Yeah, subliminally so you're like getting rid of the stuff constantly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because anxiety, a lot of, I think anytime I have anxiety, it's like a lot of ruminations yeah. about it, obviously, because yeah. you're fearing for the future. Yeah. So you're constantly thinking of like, oh, what are all these things that are going to happen? And then yeah. you write it down. You're like, oh, that's what could happen. Yeah. It makes you like rationalize what mm-hmm. you're thinking, I guess. And also rationalize the, the lack of control over it mm-hmm. a little bit yeah. and accept that. Uh, ruminating is a good word. Yeah. Um, that you can you can ruminate all 
till you're blue in the face, but <laughs> it doesn't actually change anything in the future. Yeah, it doesn't you still have to, have to go and yeah. just live through it and it will happen as it happens and ruminating doesn't, you know, it sounds cliche, but like overthinking it doesn't help. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't. Um, but it's that, normal too. Everybody does it. Everyone, yeah, yeah. you know, thinks about the conversation they're going to have with somebody in the future and how it's going to go. They play it over a million times. That's normal for sure. It's not something to beat yourself up about, but just if you do start journaling, you'll, you'll find that it happens less and less frequently. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely, it's, I think it's hard sometimes too. You got to like devote a certain time in the day to. Um, totally. To yeah. Time. Yeah. So. Um, the other thing, uh, previous podcasts we did, um, we kind of talked about attitudes and how it like affects your happiness, but, uh, um, having an optimist, uh, attitude, mm -hmm. uh, compared to a pessimist attitude actually helps the anxiety. Cause like, um, makes you feel that you can actually do something about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, totally. I would, I would hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Over the last several months yeah. of me kind of taking a more proactive stance on addressing my own like gen generalized and social anxieties. I think that just having optimistic faith that, you know, your life is okay. It's going to turn out all right. Yeah, like, yeah. Your life is happening for you, not to you is a big thing that I repeat to myself. And that kind of leads into another one, which is ties into journaling. I, I write down like things I'm thankful for all the time. Gratitude. I'm yes. That's big, big yeah. believer in, in that. And just, um, grounding yourself through that just understanding that mm -hmm. you know you might have stuff going on in your life things might not be great but at the end of the day you have everything you need yeah you just yeah. gotta recognize it puts it sit yeah. with it for a second puts can it into you. perspective yeah. a little bit yeah can help you reframe it yeah hmm. so actually i left a sheet over there for you <laughs> uh Polyvagal theory. Okay. So um, I'll put this um, the sheet we're looking at right now on the on the screen for YouTubers. About to get um, learned something here. Yeah. Um, this um, was created by Ruby Joe Walker. Um, this polyvagal theory will be a completely other episode because it's actually quite cool. But basically, it, it uh, hinges on like meditation and stuff oh, okay. to go through. So this, I was going to ask if we were going to. Talk about meditation as a tool. Oh yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Nice. Um, your vagal, um, vagal nerve is like your biggest, um, nerve and it runs through your entire body. So the, the theory is that, um, when your body's like over, um, aroused, I guess, is that it activates all these like body sensations, um, like heart, um, through the Vag the vag I think it's the vagal va vagus nerve is the or vagus yeah yeah, yeah. um so yeah then there's okay. um three levels right and you want to be in the green at the bottom there interesting yeah but then um the more activated at the top of the um table there the chart um the more severe the symptoms are and you can kind of see what the fight yeah fight or flight kind okay of thing. i see that it shows you the emotions on the chart yeah. and then the the biological reactions of your body yes to those yeah. emotions that's a lot of why um meditation does work um, right because it it directly affects a lot of the the biological the yeah biological symptoms um, so uh looking at the biological symptoms um i was actually this is really cool i didn't think of it so depending on how your anxiety feels, so if your heart rate is like really high, um, your blood pressure is high, um, you're tensing up and stuff, you're supposed to use meditation and calming techniques. Okay. Whereas when you're feeling really like fatigued and stuff from anxiety, you want to do things that will boost your heart rate. So do exercise. And right. Those are the two different types of like anxiety 
okay. that you need to separate sometimes. Yeah. And I actually did try it because there was some times where I was like really like low energy and just like almost shut down. Mm -hmm. So then um, you go, go yeah. for a little run or. Yeah. So that's a like, top freeze area. Yeah. That's where you'd use exercise. Oh, but then okay. the middle zone would be um, meditation. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, yeah. You have mentioned a couple times though the meditation. Yeah, uh, you use an app, don't you? Yeah, I'm a. I should probably be paid at this point by by Headspace for the amount of yeah the amount of promotion I give them, the amount of I talk about it. <laughs> uh, I've been using that for going on two and a half years now, on and off. Um, like I said, over the last several months, I've been taking it a little more seriously. So using it every day and it's uh it's definitely had a a great positive effect on my life um when you use it that way keep and you kind of do have to be consistent with it that's the biggest thing with meditation is you can't you know it's not a band-aid it's not yeah. you don't yeah. get to meditate once or meditate for a week and mm -hmm. and be less anxious but you meditate for weeks and then months and looking back you kind of just see the gradual changes and it is slow, but it is real. Definitely, it is definitely real. It's uh, yeah, it's repetition. Like it's uh, so it's better to meditate five minutes every day than two hours and once a week. Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't just do it all at once. It's uh, it's a training. Meditation is is just training your yeah, brain. It's exactly. Not, it's not. It's not even so much doing something. It's a, it's an exercise. You know, it's it's training your brain to accept um stress and anxiety mm -hmm. and and manage it in a more healthy way yeah yeah it definitely takes time mm -hmm. um, if yeah. you uh uh on my bucket list is definitely to attend uh a buddhist temple it's and, actually that's on my bucket list too. yeah yeah there was uh when i was in calgary retreat or something there was a, a silent retreat okay people yeah. do. it's a weekend retreat no talking the entire weekend. Yeah. I didn't go to it, but like, I actually, I think that would be a cool thing to do. Totally. Yeah. Just reset. Yeah. 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 Um, and just, yeah, get to experience A lot of times that. though, like, obviously cool. if you're, <laughs> that's why you talk about like people that are like spiritual and experienced and doing drugs and stuff like hallucinogenics. Right. Um, even something like a lot of meditation, it actually can do the same thing as those yeah. drugs. Yeah. Like, give I've, you worse anxiety. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that uh, like same similar brain yeah. brain activity yeah. to hallucinogenic drugs. And I for long time meditators and yeah, I don't uh, no backing on this, but like I just had the thought that it was like it's almost like hallucinogenic. Something they say that like opens up your mind, and the meditation does the same thing. Yeah, so right. like something you were unaware of before is now. You're now aware or just in your like nervous system it like triggered something engages more of your yeah. brain of yeah. your neurons yeah mm -hmm. like that's that's what it is so, um, just like hallucinogenic drugs you know they target areas of your brain that aren't targeted by anything yeah, else exactly and light, light those areas up i think that i think that's what it is yeah i've, yeah. I've read that or seen that somewhere would you, uh, how long, you said a week, you would go to a Buddhist temple? I think I'd do a week, yeah, yeah. a week, yeah. 10 days, maybe yeah. two weeks. Depends what, what I got going on in life, but I think that'd be really cool, yeah. The guy I worked with, his best friend, he was actually like, he was telling me, he was like, he was depressed about it, like, <laughs> he was not happy that his, his friend was kind of like suicidal and stuff, and he went to, uh, he went to Peru, actually. Oh, yeah. To do a... It was ayahuasca. ayahuasca retreat yeah. and he came back and he was just weird oh really yeah like he was just a different person yeah so yeah the brain is a scary place and when you're that's why like medication can do the same thing you know yeah. change people's personalities but also illicit drugs and hallucinogenic yeah. drugs yeah it's well it's, you know you're, it's you're like playing with fire it, it can be good i i mean there's lots of evidence to show hallucinogens can be positive for for things mm -hmm. like depression and anxiety but it's like it's I always said, scared me a little just because yeah. of how yeah well like i said you can do the same things naturally too right right through yeah. things like meditation yeah, yeah. 
so dedicated meditation mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah uh, t- take a long time to get to that state <laughs> cool well i think we'll we'll end there i think we had a good convo um if you have any topics that you would like us to cover um let us know over dm or you can email us um and if you lit enjoy listening to our conversations please let us know by rating the podcast on whatever platform you're listening to Um, we'll be posting every tuesday so make sure to hit subscribe follow and set that auto download so you don't miss an episode right on see ya thanks for having me (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.